Okay, so how is everyone today? Good? Okay, so last time we were talking about uh, rates of change and secant lines. And to remind you, just in the abstract, what it was is that we could have a plot. <coughs> like this, or a plot, something like that. And then what a secant line is, is that you select two points, two different points, and then what is the secant line? The straight line that goes through them, right? So for, those, for that particular two points, it would, it would look like that. And for these particular two points, it would look like this. <clears throat> so we went on a, a road trip, right? A mind road trip. And said, okay, well, when you, when you do this similar kind of thing uh, with a physical situation, then what does the slope of the secant line represent? fishing for that phrase that starts with a average rate of <coughs> pardon me average rate of change <coughs> okay so now we're talking about increasing and decreasing Function f is said to be increasing on an interval Increasing on an interval when? So algebraically, so we'll write down the definition here. When a less than b implies f of a less than f of b <coughs> for all a, b. So that's a suitably opaque math definition. So let's see if we can try and make it clear what it's saying. <coughs> so geometrically, <coughs> if you were to draw a picture, Increasing functions look something like this. And what I'd like for you to observe is that if you select any two points, any two points at all, A and B, in this interval, then if this is if this is the plot of F, and this is input A, then what is this? f of a, and this is input b, so this is output f of b. Yeah, 
No. <laughs> My goodness. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> when you move from, notice that what happens, what it's saying is that if you move from A to B, because B is greater than A, how are you moving? You're moving to the right. <laughs> and because f of a is less than f of b, when you move from f of a to f of b, how are you moving? Up. So what the definition means, the meaning of the algebraic definition, is every time you move right, you move up. That's what increasing means. Now, it's very important for you to keep in mind the move right business, because you might look at this red plot and say, I don't know, that looks like a pretty nice water slide, and if I were to slide on it, I'd be going down. So why is that not decreasing? decreasing. So what's wrong with my, what I'm saying? It's less than B. Right, correct. So when I'm doing this, when I'm imagining water sliding down, notice I'm moving to the left. So the increasing and decreasingness is always construed moving to the right. It's always construed moving to the right. Now, in, in time, Right? The thing that we did immediately before this topic were secant lines. Now the reason why secant lines come immediately before this is because notice that in, in that piece of function right there, you select any two points on it whatsoever and then draw the secant line. What will be the slope of, that, of, of every secant line on that cut of the function? They'll all be well, yes, I agree with that. But in particular, they'll all have a positive slope. Right? All secants on this all secants of this piece of function will have positive slope. So what do you think is coming next? Decreasing. So function f said to be decreasing Decreasing on an interval when. So let's see if we can get the correct algebraic statement out. So, what will be the correct algebraic statement? If A is greater than B, then what? Oh. So let's try and let's try and phrase it in terms of movement. So for increasing, we said move right implies move up. What should what should be the statement for for decreasing? Move right implies move down. Because we always want it to be move right. We want that to be the same in the two definitions. So A less than B 
implies f of a greater than f of b <coughs> for all a, b in the interval. So geometrically, <clears throat> on this cut of the function, Notice that you select any points in the interval, A and B, then input A maps to output F of A, and input B to output F of B. And notice that no matter where you put A and B, so long as A to the left is, is to the left of B, which is to say, so long as you move to the right, you move down. And what, what can we say about the sequence uh, in this case? They'll all have negative slope. So that's interesting. So what what increasing and decreasing mean in the end? Uh, a function is increasing on an interval if every secant on that interval has a positive slope. And it's decreasing on that interval if every secant on that interval has a negative slope. Interesting. OK. So now to, that's a little abstract. So let's have, let's make it more clear with a concrete example. Okay, so draw a nice function here. So there's a nice, nice plot. So my first question, is it in fact a function? So how do you confirm or deny this? vertical line test. So does it pass the vertical line test? Yes, right? Which is to say, does every vertical line cross it zero or one times? Yes. <clears throat> is it one to one? No. Why not? Horizontal line test, right? So down here, there's one intersection. That, that's a passing point. Okay, but here, you can see, ah, well, there's three intersections right there. So the horizontal line test requires 0, 1. And here's 3, so that's not going to work. 
So no. What's the domain? All reels. That is to say that notice that there's always an intersection. for every x. What about the range? Again, all reals. Because now there's always an intersection, at least one, for all y's. So now I can ask the new question. I can say, OK, please find the open intervals where the function is decreasing. So I'm asking for open intervals. There's a, there's a certain technical reason why I'm asking for them, but I'm just going to gloss over that and just say I'm always going to ask for open intervals. The technical reason is because is something that you could learn after after calculus probably is a good place to, to learn the technical reason. <clears throat> okay, what do you think? Right, so can you see on this part of the function it's going down. Okay. So what what is that inter open interval of inputs? from negative 1 to positive 3. <clears throat> but wait a second. This looks like a terrific water slide going that way. Can you imagine how thrilling that would be? That would be terrific. Why is that not decreasing? <coughs> Correct. It's always it's always reckoned moving to the right. So if you're on this bit of function, if you're on this bit of function and moving to the right, you'd be going up. Alternatively, to cut that piece of function, imagine selecting two points and then drawing the secant. How would the secant slope, positively or negatively? Positively on that piece. Okay, so then six, the open intervals, <clears throat> where it's increasing. How about it? <clears throat> yes. Union. To infinity. So why don't we include those negative one? Because I said open, the f so for, so I, I, c I could leave it there, right? Just by, by virtue of the fact that I said I want the open intervals, that's why. Okay, now there's there's a there's a good technical reason, but I don't want to I don't want to get into it. So <coughs> ask for closed intervals, though. I won't ask. I won't ask. <coughs> for ver for various reasons, you can get into. You can get it into, into trouble due to something called topological properties, where things can get messed up. But I'm but what I'm telling you is that I'm a, I'm going to keep you in a walled garden where we'll be safe, okay? And if you want to venture out into the great wild of of functions, they can be pretty wild. Uh, you're going to have to take some more math classes. <coughs> okay, good. Next. <coughs> so now, more or less same question. <coughs> Except now I'm not gonna I'm not gonna draw it for you. 
Instead, what I'm going to say is I'm going to say, please provide a rough sketch <coughs> of f of x is 1 over x, 2. Please tell me if it's 1 to 1. <coughs> 3, it's domain. 4, it's range. Five, the open intervals, where it's decreasing, and six, the open intervals, where it's increasing. Now here's where I'm testing whether or not you've really memorized this, these families of functions that I said you need to memorize. So I don't need you to plot it in the sense in the sense that I don't need you to evaluate a whole bunch of points and then connect the dots and all that. I don't need that. I just need a sketch. <coughs> so this function is common enough in experience to have its own name. What is its name? The reciprocal function. <coughs> okay. So in particular, it belongs to the reciprocal family. And its sketch looks like this. More or less. <coughs> So, is it one to one? What does one to one mean? Visually, it means it passes the horizontal line test. So, I think we can all agree that down here it passes the horizontal line test, and up here it passes the horizontal line test. But maybe there's a slight concern about what happens here. Now when you start getting here? Okay. Well, it over here to the left and over here to the right, it does get quite flat. So flat that being being a human sized, you wouldn't be able to detect that it's not flat. But it's not flat. Uh, in the sense that, well, is there a is there a difference between cutting a a, a pizza into four slices versus five slices? Sure. And you could probably tell the difference readily just by looking. What about, is there a difference between cutting a pizza into 400 and 500 slices? <laughs> 400 slices versus 500 slices. Yeah, there's a difference, <laughs> right? Sort of mathematically, anyway, there's a difference. For, for, for the purposes of eating, there's not much difference. But there's a difference, right? So the further you go out, yes, all the values are different. They just get really, really small quickly. So is it one-to-one? -one? Yes. What's its domain? Very good. So algebraically, it must be this way because this expression is defined everywhere except zero. Geometrically, it must be this way because this is the plot of the function and there is an intersection for every x value except that one right there. 
What's the range? Same. For similar reasons. Okay, where are the open intervals that it is decreasing? Same, right? Let's consider. <coughs> Let's ignore this piece, the top right piece, for a moment. Just ignore it and just look at this piece. So how about the stuff between my fingers? Can we agree that that's decreasing? In the sense that you select any, in, in, in whatever sense you like. As you move to the right, you go down. Alternatively, in that piece that's between my fingers, if you select any two points and then draw the secant, that secant has negative slope. And this property continues all the way that way and all the way that way. So this whole piece is decreasing. Similarly, this piece is decreasing because as you move to the right, you move down. Interesting. So, should, for decreasing, should I, since it's since it's apparently always decreasing, should I write from negative infinity to in, to infinity? What should I write? Can't include zero. Can't include zero right? It couldn't possibly be decreasing on on an interval that includes zero, because it's not even defined on an interval that includes zero. Uh, I just said not to do that, and then I wrote it. Okay, how about where it's increasing? Yeah, so there, there are no... There are no intervals where it's, where it's increasing. So now, we won't, I won't draw it and write it, but now let's just talk about it for a moment. How about the squared reciprocal function? How is the squared reciprocal function alike, but yet different from this one? Yeah, nothing will be negative now. It'll be like you take this branch, this low branch, this low arm, and flip it up so that it's like a volcano, the volcano one. So supposing we do that, that I, I grab this, and then I twist it up, and so it's, now it's like a volcano. then would it be one-to-one? -one? No, right? Because there'd be nothing down here, so that'd be fine, but then up here you'd get two intersections. Okay, what would be its domain? Same. Same. What would be its range? Zero to, Zero to infinity. Because nothing <coughs> in the negative outputs is reachable anymore. Uh, then it would be increasing on the left on the left piece, be increasing and decreasing on the right piece. Okay, so now we we drew a lot of functions, the reciprocal ones, the power ones like parabolas and cubics and quartics and things like that. We drew the radicals. We've drawn absolute values. I could ask you for any any of them. Any of them. <clears throat> okay. So now something else. Something different. Section 3 4. Operations on functions. So, this, um, this section. Part of one way to think about the topics of this section is by analogy to numbers, in the sense th in the sense that numbers have the following nice property: you can take any two numbers, and you can combine them in a variety of ways to get a new number. So, for example, you could take two numbers three and five, and you could add them, and you get a new number. Or you could take two numbers and subtract them, and get a new number. Or multiply them and get a new number. And you can almost always divide them to get a new number. Why do I have to? Why do I have to say almost always? Zero. Yeah, zero, right? Okay, so functions are the same. That is to say, you can take two functions, you can add them, subtract them, multiply, and divide them to get new functions. 
except now there is the additional requirement of domain okay so numbers don't have a domain right they don't care what x is right <laughs> what is 7 equal to when x is equal to 4 7 right <laughs> 7 doesn't care about x okay so but functions they have they have domains so you have to track that that aspect carefully okay so then let f be a function with domain a and let g be a function with domain b then first we can make a new function f plus g so this is defined <coughs> as f plus g evaluate at x is de will be defined as f of x plus g of x with domain and now we have to try and figure out what that should be Okay. So let's imagine for a moment. If you wanted to evaluate f of x, I gave you some x, then where would that x need to be? It'd have to be in A, right? It couldn't be anywhere else, because otherwise you couldn't do it. Similar, similarly, if I wanted you to evaluate g of x, where would the x need to be? in B. It'd have to be in that one. So now, what I'm saying is that if you want to evaluate the sum, you're going to have to evaluate this part, which means where must x be? In A. And you must then evaluate this part, which means where does x need to be? In B. So where does x need to be? Yeah, it has to be on the one hand in A, in in A, and on the other hand in B. Now, how do you denote that? So this is this is a set, and this is a set. So we want the all the set which indicates that you're you're in set A and also in set B. That one, yeah. A intersect B. So you can kind of kind of remember that because because if you were driving your car on a north south road and you came to a light at an east west road then that little region of road that's on both roads is called the intersection right? is the part of the road that's on the north south road and it's also on the east west road it belongs to both of them so that's the intersection Okay. So it's like this because if this rectangle represents all the universe of all conceivable x's, and if this is the set set A where f is defined, and this is set B where g is defined, then in order to evaluate the sum, that means you have to be in the A circle, also in the B circle, and that's this sliver in the middle. That's the intersection. OK. So subtraction is defined similarly. So 2, f minus g, defined as f minus g evaluate at x is f evaluate at x minus g evaluate at x what will be its domain same thing for the same reason right you got to be able to evaluate both of them three 
f product g is defined as defined as so that is a solid dot not an open dot and if you have no idea why I just said that then don't worry about it <laughs> so f product g evaluate at x is f evaluate at x multiply g evaluate at x with domain same thing for same reasons you've got to be able to evaluate f and you've got to be able to evaluate g so you've got to be able to evaluate them both for f divide g is defined as f divide g evaluate at x is f of x divided by g of x with domain with domain what? I left a longer blank this time <laughs> With domain what? So you've at least got to be in A intersect B, right? For the same reasons as before. You've got to be able to evaluate the numerator. You've got to be able to evaluate the denominator. It's not that x can't be 0. It's that g of x can't be 0, right? You've got to be able to evaluate f. You've got to be able to evaluate G, and G's got to be anything but zero. <clears throat> so now the picture, if you like pictures, would be something like this. So here's the B set, but down here there's this little football shaped region where B is zero. So everywhere in here, B is zero. So the place that we're allowed to evaluate is now up here. <coughs> because this set is where G of X is zero. So this little bit that I didn't shade in, that's where f is defined and g is defined, but g is 0 right there, so that's, that's out. OK. <clears throat> so that was a little abstract. So let's make it clear with a concrete example. So let f of x be 2x plus 5 on the interval uh, 5 to 19 and let g of x be 3x plus 4 on the interval 1 to 15. So first question Please evaluate f of 10. So what is f of 10? Two times ten plus five, well that's twenty-five. Okay. <clears throat> How about F evaluated at three? Oh, that's 
Yeah, this is undefined. To which you might object a little bit and say, now wait a second. You just did 2 times 10 plus 5, and that's 25. That's pretty straightforward. It's just as straightforward to say 2 times 3 is 6 plus 5 is 11. Yet, f of 3 is not defined. Why not? It's not in the domain. Right? Because functions have, the, have a domain that, that comes with them. And 3 is not in there. Now, if I was to just give you that... If I was to just, just write that down all by itself and say, well, tell me, what's the natural domain of 2x plus 5? Then you would respond, all reals. But that's not what I did. I said, here's a function defined on this interval and nowhere else. Then what's f of 3? The correct response is to say, well, you, you, can't, you can't do that. Okay. 2. Find a simplified expression for and domain of F product G. Well, I'm kind of rushing now because I have one more thing I want to do after this. <coughs> so f product g, according to the definition, that would be f of x product g of x, like so. And then you substitute in the pieces. So that would be 2x plus 5 multiplied by 3x plus 4. And you foil this out and collect 6x squared plus, uh, plus what? 8x plus, yeah, 23 plus 20. Okay, so is there any question getting to this right here? So have we answered the question? No, right? We haven't. What, what bit of the question has yet to be answered? The domain. Now, if I was to just write that expression down right there, this one right here, and just say, okay, well, what is the natural domain of that expression? Well, what's the answer? All reals. But that's not the question. In order to do this, in order to use this expression, you have to be in F's domain, and you have to be in G's domain. You gotta be in both. So what is the domain then? Five to fifteen. Because the domain can be calculated as five to nineteen intersect one to uh, fifteen. <clears throat> and when you've done enough of these and you get accustomed to it then you can say, ah, well, this is just 5 to 15. But it still helps to remember how you can calculate this without brain magic. And it can be done by <coughs> plotting the intervals. So the le of, of those four numbers, 5, 19, 1, 15, the least is 1, so plot it this to the left, 1, and then the next is 5, and then the next is 15, and then the next is 19. And to be in the intersection, is to have both points, both kinds of points. So back here at, in the negatives, you can see we don't have a green or a red. 
and then oh at one we start to have we start to have a green are we in the intersection no but we would be in what the well we're in the domain of g and we would be in the union right we'd be in the union it's only when we get to here when we're in the intersection where you have red and green then you're in the intersection all the way up to 15 and then never more <coughs> Any question about this? Okay, last thing. So I'll say that this is function f of x in red. And then function g of x in green. Okay, so g of x, and I could ask, what is the domain of f what is the domain of g what is the domain of f plus g How about it? How do you find the domain of F? The red, right? So over here, there's no red, so we're not in F's domain. And then, ah, I can see that that's the first, the first place that we're in F's domain. And we're in F's domain all the way to there. So the domain of F is inputs negative 2 all the way up to 5. Similarly, what is the domain of G? Negative 4 to positive 3. What is the domain of the sum? Negative 2 to 3. Because visually, what's required to compute the sum is you need a red and a green point. So notably, <coughs> ah, here I have a green point. But that can't be in the domain of the sum function because I don't also have a red point. Similarly, over here, I have a red point. But that cannot be in the domain of the sum function because I don't also have a green point. Alternatively, you could just take these two intervals and intersect them. Okay, last thing. Is how would you actually compute the sum from the picture? Well, for example, this input, input negative 2, is in the sum function because we have a red point and a green point. What is the red output? 2. What is the green output? Negative 3. So what is the sum output? 2 plus negative 3. Negative 1. Similarly, how about this next one that's kind of obvious? What is the red output? Negative 1. What is the green output? 2. The sum of negative 1 and 2 is? 1. And here, finally, what is the red output? 
the green output. Three. <laughs> I've kind of crowded one, two, three. <coughs> so then the sum output is one plus three is four. So the sum function looks like this. Now, suppose that I make the following mistake, or you, or you witness one of your colleagues make the following mistake. How would you explain to them what went wrong? Suppose that they did this, suppose they drew this, and this, and that looks good, and then they do something like this. So this new bit is what I just drew. What's wrong with this? How would you explain it to your colleague? That bit that you just drew doesn't make any sense. Yeah, how about, how about you look at it like this? So here, it kind of makes sense. Like, oh, we added the red point, the red height to the green height. What did, what did you do here? There's, there's no green point. You just, just make one up, <laughs> I suppose. OK, so then, when, when drawing these pictures, these little tails these little bits that exist, that's, that's telltale that student has not fully understood the concept, right? You can only have a sum function where you have red and green points. Okay, so have a nice Monday.